Uh, my name is Aaron. Um, I am the head of the membership team at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and uh, welcome all of you to our autumn member speakeasy. Um, twice each year or sometimes more, um, we invite current members like you to meet up with uh, fellow internet freedom supporters and the EFF staff. Uh, of course, it's still tough to meet in person, so for the past year and a half, we've been experimenting with different platforms and formats uh, for visual or for virtual uh, member meetups, um, including Zoom. Um, it's been great to see members from far off places who would otherwise not be able to participate, of course. Um, and in fact, uh, if you'd like to say hello to folks here in the room right now, feel free to use the chat box um, to type in your name and sort of generally where you are in the world, if you'd like. Um, even though EFF will start having in-person events in the near future, uh, we'll continue holding space for different kinds of virtual ones going forward. So, you know, hooray internet. Um, so a few uh, items of housekeeping before we begin. Um, many of you are familiar with Zoom at this point, but a couple of reminders. Uh, please keep yourself muted while our guests are speaking. Um, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions in the final portion of the program. Uh, if you have a question for our speakers at any time, uh, just type it into the chat and my colleague Christian will note it. Um, alternatively, um, you can find a raise hand button when you click on uh, reactions in the bottom of your screen here. Uh, in the last 20 minutes of today's program, Christian's going to call on some of you with raised hands and also read out some questions that he's collected from chat. So don't have to worry there. Um, so also note that EFF has a code of conduct for our public events, so please be kind. Um, you can check that out at EFF.org slash event expectations. Uh, and finally, I just want to thank you all for making EFF's work possible. Uh, this is an incredibly important time for us to stand up for the rights, freedoms, and interests of ordinary technology users. So you know, thank you all for being on our side for that. Um, all right, so in preparation for this event, um, we asked folks on Twitter to tell us what uh, internet freedom issue they wanted to hear about. Um, a lot has uh, happened lately. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, um, so much of the web is now encrypted that we're getting ready to deprecate our HTTPS Everywhere browser extension after a decade of successful advocacy for secure certs. So that's um, pretty huge and big for us, and we're really <clears> excited <throat> about that. Um, we're also fighting to ensure that uh, the European Union's Transformative Digital Services Act can preserve user freedom and human rights. And uh, also in the last few months, um, we used multiple tactics and pressure points to stop Apple from installing dangerous message and photo scanning capabilities on its devices. So lots and lots of big stuff and important progress for online rights. Um, but today, um, we have the honor of hosting a discussion about uh, uh, law enforcement and uh, their use of surveillance technologies, its impact on your privacy and what we can do about it. Um, so today I am pleased to welcome two in-house experts in this area. Uh, first, uh, EFF Director of Investigations, Dave Moss, um, whose work focuses on surveillance technology, government transparency, press freedoms, immigration enforcement at the US-Mexico border, prisoner rights, and much, much more. Uh, welcome, Dave. And um, also, uh, I would like to like everyone to welcome EFF staff attorney Syra Hussein from our civil liberties team. Uh, previously, Syra was part of the criminal justice reform program at Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus, and her current work centers on the intersection of racial justice and surveillance. Uh, Syra and Dave, thank you very much for being here, and please take it away. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron. Um, so today, uh, Syra and I are going to be talking primarily about license plate readers. We're going to be talking about probably some other technologies too, but we're going to focus particularly on this technology. Um, and I'm going to switch over to a slideshow. Uh, I'm going to sort of start with a very overview slide for folks who uh, you know like to hear me talk, but also like to have everything jammed into you know one single slide. Um, but for background, when I joined EFF in 2013, I had no idea that these four letters, ALPR, would consume so much of my life. Uh, I didn't have a car at the point, so I didn't really think too much about vehicle surveillance, but this kind of landed on our lap in about 12, 2012, 2013. And the more I've looked over it over the last few years, the more I've researched it, the more convinced I am that this is one of the most nefarious technologies uh, in use by, by law enforcement. This slide, I'm going to go into detail about everything on here. And so I'm just going to go on a sort of overview in this first part of this, this discussion about what this technology is, uh, you know, how, what are they, how do they work, and how do we know that police use them? So uh, first thing I want to tell you is that this technology is pretty widespread. Um, we have a project called the Atlas of Surveillance. Um, you can check it out at atlasofsurveillance.org, 
where we have a whole bunch of people uh, pulling together research on about 12 different technologies around the country and adding it to this database and map. And so far we've documented 950 agencies using ALPR. I think ultimately, you know, there's probably about 1,500, 2,000 using license plate readers, but it's a process of gathering all this information. But the point is, is that, you know, wherever you go in the, across the country, you're probably gonna have your car scanned by a license plate reader at some point or another, particularly if you're in a very heavily populated area in California or in the Northeast or in the South. So license plate readers are essentially just cameras. Uh, cameras attached to computers that uh, you know, are, are directed in the direction of where a license plate might be. And when it sees letters and numbers, the algorithm grabs them, turns them into machine readable characters. It might do document the color of your vehicle. It might you know, make note of what model your vehicle is. It might grab information about your bumper sticker. Some of the systems out there might note whether your car has damage to it or scratches or, um, you, know, um, you know, your fender is bent in a little bit, but it attaches a time and date stamp to it, as well as the GPS coordinates for that, that scan, and then uploads, uploads that to a database that police can then search. So I want to go over what these look like in the real world. Um, so there's a few different flavors of, of license plate readers. And the first flavor I would describe as a fixed license plate reader or a stationary license plate reader. Um, frequently, if you're driving around, you might see these mounted on traffic signals or light posts. They're gonna look pretty similar often to other kinds of surveillance cameras. And so really you'll notice them in the sense that, they're, they're, that if they are pointed at a road, then they're probably going to be a license plate reader. I do wanna flag the one at the bottom right here in the image. That is a newer license plate reader called a Flock camera. And Flock has been selling these cameras, particularly to homeowners associations. So if you live in a neighborhood that's a gated community or has a homeowner association, you might see that these cameras have, have, have started to pop up. Um, another version of the license plate reader is what I would call a mobile ALPR or a patrol mounted ALPR. These are the same cameras, but instead of being mounted in one fixed position that captures all the cars passing by, these are actually attached to vehicles. So usually police cars uh, you know, or police vans, and they capture not only the cars that pass by this, this, this police car, but the police car could actually drive around and collect license plates. So it's not just collecting moving vehicles, but also parked vehicles. And there's this, uh, there's this uh, technique called gridding that police do to gather information on entire neighborhoods. So this slide right here is uh, from the Chandler Police Department in Arizona. And this slide specifically tells police that if you have one of the vehicles with a license plate reader on it, whenever you have downtime or you're not responding to a call, go grid it. Uh, and they define gridding as driving up and down every street in an area to capture all license plates. And I want to flag in their in their this sort of third third line of their presentation, in which they say um, the reason to do this is to help us gather intelligence to solve future cases. This is not about solving crimes that happened in the past. That's not about crimes that are that are you know happening right now. They are actually collecting this stuff in case one day there is a crime. Uh, they're you know, building a kind of time machine of sorts of where people's cars are. Um, another way that you have license plate readers are with these, these speed trailers. Um, not all speed trailers are gonna be license plate readers. A lot of them are based on radar, but as you're, you know, if you see one of these as you're driving up and you see that it's telling you your speed limit is whatever, Look to see if there are cameras, see if you can spot that because, I mean, don't get in a car accident by paying too much attention, but, you know, like take a look and see if you can recognize whether it's a, a radar based truck or a license plate reader, because really the main purpose of this, this device that I'm showing you is not to check your speed. The checking your speed part is kind of like camouflage for it. Uh, you know, it puts it there, you're noticing it, but ultimately it's there to collect your data. Um, something to emphasize as well is that like, it's not just like cops have their cameras and that's the only data that they access. They can purchase access to a private database of, of uh, license plate data that was collected by a private company. So there's a private company called DRN Data that uh, equips 
um, uh, repo cars and tow truck drivers with ALPRs, and then ma amasses this gigantic database that it then sells access to. Uh, but police can actually share, uh, you know, data with each other. So one police department might get data from, you know, 500 other police departments. So you don't actually need to have, if you're a police department, you actually don't have to have the cameras yourself to, you know, surveil people's uh, driving patterns. You can actually just buy access to a database. Um, and so, like I said, this just kind of goes into a little bit, you know, uh, more detail about what kind of data they might access. Any given police department is probably going to have access to other law enforcement agencies' data, that private data. There might be homeowners associations using those flock cameras that are sharing data with the police. Um, you know, business associations and, you know, might set up their own systems for collecting license plate readers. A lot of parking garages, particularly on college campuses, are collecting data and feeding it to police. But toll bridges and parking enforcement often rely on license plate readers as well. Um, some terms you might hear come up are uh, this term called the hot list. A hot list is the same thing as a watch list. It's just a list of vehicles that police are actively looking for. And so if they put a hot list into their system, they can get real-time alerts on whenever a car on that hot list is seen by a camera. Or if the patrol car is rolling around with its own license plate reader on it, uh, it'll get like a beep every time they pass a vehicle on a hot list, and then they can choose to follow that car until it makes a, a traffic mistake and then pull that person over. Um, to give you an idea about how law enforcement actually uses license plate readers in practice, so there are those real-time alerts, like I said, you add you to a hot list, and then I can get updates like emails or text messages whenever you're seen by a, uh, a uh, you know, seen by one of these cameras. I can go into the database, and I can put in your license plate and I can see backwards in time where your car has been, you know, sometimes going years back. Um, I can put in a location, you know, say that's like, you know, let's say a cannabis dispensary or a gun store or a mosque. And I can put that in there and I can see what vehicles were seen uh, near that address, or I can put in multiple addresses and see what cars were seen at all of those addresses. Um, I can do something called network mapping where I can put in your vehicle's license plate and the system will tell me what vehicles were seen near your vehicle on a regular basis. And that would, you know, reveal maybe who your, your, your family members are, who your coworkers are, and that kind of thing. And then finally, something we see police do is use the predictive capacity of these algorithms. They want to find out where you are going to be tomorrow at one o'clock. They can go look at the system and the system, depending on how much data they have on you, you know, will predict where you might be at any given time. I'll show you what this looks like. So this is these are these are public records that we've gotten through our, our research. So this is like you know one of the the online interfaces, and you can see here they're looking for uh, a particular vehicle here, and you can see that it says like I think down here at the bottom to move my little cursor here, but it'll say that like you know the you know the times the subject's vehicle was sighted, how many you know like. You know, at this particular location, when was it last seen? You can see that this vehicle goes back to, so it was like, what, seven times between May and December. Um, you know, so this is kind of what that looks like. Um, and then another version of it, so this is when they do those, what's called geofencing, where they pick a particular address and they want to see what cars uh, were near that particular address. Um, some reporters in Atlanta uh, did a really good, um, uh, you know, investigation where they were able to get access to license plate reader data, and they mapped out what it looked like for one vehicle uh, traveling around. And so this particular vehicle in 2018, just driving it around the Atlanta area, you know, in the, scan, in the course of one day, it was captured 15 times just driving around. Now, this was in 2018, and I can tell you that the Atlanta area over the last two years has exploded with ALPR. There are homeowners associations with license plate readers. The power company has installed license plate readers on, on their electric poles. There have been more and more adoption by law enforcement agencies of various systems and increasing the systems they have. So even though there's only 15 scans here in 2018, this you know, same vehicle, if this, this research was done again, would probably be astronomically higher. Unfortunately, following this research, uh, the state of Georgia banned their ability to do this research, so we won't actually be able to see information like this again, at least not out of, out of Georgia. 
And I think the last point I want to get across is that uh, by definition, for me, license plate readers are a form of mass surveillance. And what I mean by that is that they are collecting massive amount of data on every driver, regardless of suspicion. This is not a targeted surveillance where they have a suspect and they're doing a stakeout outside their house and they get a warrant for it. It's none of that. It is everybody's under investigation. And to give you a size, an idea of the scale, we recently published a survey, and I say survey, but it's actually like a collection of public records we pulled together using the California Public Records Act. We found that of 65 agencies we looked at, they collected 1.4 billion scans uh, uh, just over a two-year period. But by their own, own records, less than half a percent, I'm sorry, 0.05% of those plates uh, were on a hot list, meaning that 99.9% you know, of these plates were just of innocent people uh, who had no connection to a, no suspected connection to a crime at the time it was collected. And I'm going to put this slide up for just another second, uh, but that's my kind of introduction. Um, I, from there, I want to sort of bring in Syra so we can talk uh, through some of the, the worries and concerns we have about this technology and how this might impact people. Um, I, I'm going to actually stop screen sharing that now. And uh, Syra, when we're talking about license plate readers, what for you are like the immediate concerns that come to mind? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it can be apparent, right? The fact that you're driving around in public and that automatically means that you're assist, you're, you're being, your information is being collected. Not just the information about where your car has been, but also information related to like who's in the vicinity, if there's a passenger, if there's a driver. Um, and when you can piece together all that information, it can be highly revealing of your movements. But like, most surveillance technologies that are used by law enforcement um, as uh, in addition to the tools that, uh, that non-technological tools that law enforcement uses, we know that this has a particular impact, um, a disproportionate impact on communities of color. And so there was an ACLU report that came out a couple of years ago that um, with the aid of public records requests showed that ICE, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, has been using um, ALPR information to identify people for detention and deportation. Um, they do this through access to some of these private networks in which law enforcement um, agencies are contributing and listing ICE as a sharing partner. So they're able to basically go into the system and not just get access to all of the data that they've collected, but also wide swaths of data from across the country um, about individuals who may be under their suspicion. Um, Moreover, we know that you know NYPD, when it was um, targeting Muslim communities for surveillance, oftentimes what they were doing was setting up um, ALPR uh, scanners to be um, in the vicinity of mosques to determine who's driving by uh, a mosque or who's entering a mosque. And all of that is very concerning because um, you can blanket surveil, and then after that, you may use that to target certain communities. And that is a real concern here at EFF and real concern of the work that I do. Thank you. Um, I, I wanna add on to that a little bit. Uh, a few other things that are of concern to me, are, and these are problems we've, we've, we've encountered in look, researching ALPR. Um, uh, you know, similar to how this can be abused to target immigrant communities and, uh, uh, you know, re religious minorities. We've also seen this used to target activists, whether that be the collecting license plates from people who attend protests, to sort of more, you know, heinous uses. There was a case out of Canada where police were upset about a particular journalist who'd been critical of law enforcement, and they added him to a license plate reader database, hoping they could catch him leaving a bar so they could arrest him and then, you know, you know, discredit his reporting. Um, Certainly with, with these systems, we see a lot of issues with data breaches. Uh, one of the uh, uh, vendors for face recognition and license plate reader technology to DHS had a pretty significant uh, uh, breach, I believe about two years ago called Perceptix. Um, but then we have a lot of issues with errors. Like these, these, you know, just like you might hear about errors with face recognition, there are plenty of errors that happen with license plate readers. Uh, one of the, the earliest cases happened in San Francisco where uh, a woman who happened to be a, a municipal bus driver uh, was just driving, doing her thing, and a police license plate reader misread one of the letters in her license plate, matching it to a hot list. And the next thing you know, she's having a very traumatic encounter with police, with guns, with them putting their hands on her, and she ended up winning a, a pretty large settlement uh, because of that. 
Um, similarly, in Aurora, Colorado, um, fairly recently, there was a, a group of teenagers who were hauled out of their car and put in a traumatic situation because a license plate reader told cops that, oh, this person, you know, this is a stolen vehicle, when really the license plate was like a stolen vehicle in a whole different state, and that the system did not register that this was the same number, but for a different state than the wanted vehicle. Um, yeah, and I think that there's just some other, you know, issues that come up wrong with secrecy and police not being particularly open about how they use license plate readers, but also the companies themselves tend to set up a, a relationship with law enforcement where they can tell police to not tell the press about the technology without them signing off on the messaging. So there's a lot of stuff that, that comes up. Um, before we go on to the next part, sorry, did any other, uh, any other concerns pop out at you as we were, we were discussing? I, I think you've covered the vast majority of them, but you know, it, it really is about the, the fact of surveillance and the surveillance targeting particular communities, as well as the abuse and misuse of the system that we've seen over and over again. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of EFF's work in this area, and I'm going to talk a lot about the transparency efforts related to this and some of the legislative efforts, and then hand off to Syra to talk about um, some of the legal work that we've done, and particularly our big new case on this. Um, so for one, a lot of what we've done has been related to, um, to government transparency and just trying to learn about license plate readers. So back in 2012, uh, uh, one of our, our lead attorneys in this area, Jennifer Lynch, joined the ACLU in suing the Los Angeles Police Department and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office, trying, because they just wanted to get one week's worth of license plate reader data to analyze what the privacy impact was on it. And, you know, outrageously, LAPD and LA Sheriff came back and said, we can't give you these records because they're investigative records. And we're like, what do you mean they're investigative records? Like who's under investigation? And they pretty much came back and said, everyone who drives in LA is under investigation. Therefore we can use our investigative privilege to withhold that. Um, uh, 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 Jennifer Lynch and our co-counseled ACLU uh, did not accept that and took it all the way up to the California Supreme Court where many years later we emerged victorious and we do now have our hands on that data. Um, we did something similar in Oakland, where we were able to get a week's worth of data uh, uh, several years ago, um, and we analyzed it, and sure enough, that data showed that Oakland Police Department officers were gridding neighborhoods, and particularly uh, Black and lower income neighborhoods. Um, a lot of what we, you'll hear me talk a lot about our work we do in California, and part of that is because we have a law in California that um, does require some regulation and um, transparency around license plate readers. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that law in just a second, but one of those things that it requires is uh, that every agency that uses license plate reader needs to have a policy on their website. And so we've been going around trying to find those policies, and one of the things we found was that the Sacramento County uh, Department of Health and Human Services, they're the ones who manage uh, food stamps, SNAP benefits, and other you know, uh, social welfare programs, had been using license plate reader to investigate benefits, uh, uh, benefit recipients. And they never had a policy in place. They never went through the public process they're supposed to go to. And when we called them out, they ended up canceling that program. So this is just sort of another example of, of the success we've had in pushing back on this. Um, we have also filed more than a thousand public records requests nationwide for license plate reader data to find out how much data people are collecting, who they're sharing it with. And we're also able to uncover how some, uh, some shopping malls in Southern California were sharing data, license plate reader data, uh, specifically with ICE. Um, on the legislative front, as I mentioned, we supported a bill called SB 34, which did put some regulations in place, including regulations on who they can, who police can share data with, uh, how you know what kind of um, policies they need to have, and what kind of process they need to go through. Um, we've also had some some not successful times in the legislature. Uh, we proposed a bill called SB uh, 712 that would have allowed Californians to cover their license plates when parked. And we were very, very happy with this bill. We had bipartisan support, but unfortunately the police also have bipartisan support and ultimately it was, it was voted down in the California Senate. 
But we did come back and were able to work with Senator Scott Wiener to get a state audit um, into license plate readers, which totally found that everything that we'd been complaining about was true. Um, that four police departments they looked at were violating the law on a regular basis, and it was a problem. And so now we're supporting a new bill called SB 210 uh, that is working its way through the legislature. So that kind of carries through the, a lot of the research and um, legislation we've done on this. Um, but I want to pass on to... Oh, sorry, I got a little echo there. I want to pass on to Syrah. Syrah, could you talk to us first a little bit about some of the, uh, the legal work we've done in amicus briefs, and then maybe you, we can move on to the, the new case. Yeah, that sounds great. And uh, I'll just note that uh, SB 210, unfortunately, did uh, die this, uh, or uh, yeah, it, it died this past year. Um, and we were not able to um, basically get a, a lesser retention period. Um, so that is still something that, you know, we're thinking through. And I know many other organizations are also thinking through um, ways of, of protecting people and making sure that um, ALPR information isn't just readily available to uh, everybody, essentially, um, and that law enforcement agencies aren't collecting it and retaining it indefinitely. Um, so moving on a little bit to um, our amicus work. So um, amicus briefs are something that EFF regularly engages in. They're basically friend of the court briefs where we're not a party in the litigation. But what we are seeking to do is um, uh, try to weigh in with our expertise um, on these issues uh, of surveillance technologies and the impact that they have. Um, and so one of the things that we, we have done is um, we filed an amicus brief um, talking about ALPR data. This was in the context of a Virginia state law that um, identified um, uh, automated license plate reader uh, potentially as being um, personally identifiable information. We supported that. We said that um, ALPR data is in fact personally identifiable because it reveals so much about um, a person, including the location of where their car is. It can piece together where you live, where you work, um, potentially who you're associating with, um, as well as other um, um, issues like capturing uh, photographs of the driver and passenger, for example. Um, so we said that uh, this information is not just personally identifiable, but it can also chill First Amendment activity. Um, and the, the Virginia uh, Supreme Court um, you know, ruled uh, that that in fact was the case, that it is personally identifiable information. Um, we also filed an amicus brief um, talking about uh, uh, automated license plate reader data. And we argued that um, the Supreme Court's decision in Carpenter back in 2018, which was a de decision that said law enforcement must get a warrant to access historical cell site location information data. Um, we said that that should apply to automated license plate readers. Um, and the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court um, in that case adopted many of these arguments, um, finding that this is in fact um, personally identifiable information that um, should be limited um, by, by a warrant. I think in that particular case, it was a, um, it didn't apply, but uh, overall, some of these arguments were definitely persuasive to courts. And we continue to push for this type of advocacy and um, legal reasoning um, as, as it comes up. Um, and we imagine that it will continue to, because as Davis said, ALPRs have exploded um, over the last several years in terms of who is using them, particularly um, and including use by law enforcement. Thanks, Sarah. So I am super excited about the case we just filed. Uh, it is, it just blows blows me away. Like just reading this thing is just, uh, uh, it's just gripping and it's intense. And it, 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 it tell us about tell us about this case. I'm not even I'm not even going to preface it anymore. Sure. Um, so last month, uh, EFF and uh, several affiliates of the ACLU, um, all three affiliates of the ACLU in California, actually. And filed a lawsuit in Marin County uh, against the Marin County Sheriff on behalf of three activists for violating two California laws that protect immigrants and motorists' privacy. Um, so in Marin County, what happens is the sheriff shares um, ALPR data with 18 federal agencies, including ICE and Customs and Border Protection, um, and over 400 out-of-state agencies. And so if you remember back to that law that Dave told you about, SB 34, that within that law, it limits the sharing of ALPR data only to California agencies. And so the sharing of 
um, this, this data with uh, federal and out of state agencies is a violation of the law. So we have filed suit. Um, one of the claims is under SB 34 and the other claim is under SB 54, which is known as the California Values Act. Um, and that was a law passed back in, uh, I believe it was 2017. So it went into effect in 2018. And that law um, limits the ability of local law enforcement, local and state law, law enforcement in California to um, collaborate with federal immigration enforcement. And so it says, do not spend money or other types of resources like personnel to engage in federal immigration enforcement. And here, um, by sharing this ALPR data with ICE and CBP, we allege that this violates um, uh, SB 54 because the Marin County Sheriff is basically assisting with Im immigration enforcement by passing along this ALPR data um, to these agencies. Um, so we are really excited about this. This is the first lawsuit of its kind under SB 34 to be filed. Um, and you know, to note, it, Marin County, the, the Sheriff's Department, interestingly enough, was one of the four agencies that that California State Auditor's Report covered. And it basically found that they were sharing with these agencies that they weren't supposed to. And despite being put on notice through the State Auditor's Report, they have continued to share with these agencies that they're not supposed to be sharing with. So we have um, sued. So, so sorry, who, who, are, who are we suing on behalf of in this case? Um, we're suing on behalf of three activists who are very involved in Marin County, their community members, and they have been um, trying to hold the sheriff accountable for um, his collaboration with ICE, not just in the ALPR context, but also in the ways in which the, the sheriff is assisting ICE with um, identifying people in jails um, and, and things like that, uh, turning people over when, when the sheriff isn't supposed to be doing that. So these are longtime community members, activists, um, and folks who um, were horrified by the fact that this ALPR data is being shared with ICE and CBP and many out-of-state agencies in violation of the law. So what, what's the hopeful outcome? Like if we win, what, what happens? Yeah, so we have sued um, for an injunction and for a declaration that um, the sheriff has violated the law. And the injunction would uh, seek to stop the sheriff from sharing with any um, out of state or federal agencies, including ICE and CBP, um, and basically to follow the law, follow SB 34. It's very clear that um, the this, this sharing is only supposed to be restricted to California agencies. And so this out of state um, sharing is uh, in violation of the law. And I imagine that, that in that case, we would also hope that any other California agency would you know, that might be sharing with ICE would look at this case and, you know, realize that maybe they're, you know, need to change their policies as well. Yeah, it's interesting that you raised that because um, Marin County is not the only one that is in violation of the law. As Dave noted, there were three other entities that also were um, part of the California State Auditor's Report and found that those three were also violating the law. Um, and we know that there are hundreds of agencies throughout California that are really playing fast and loose. They are sharing all kinds of ALPR data with um, and, you know, entities as far as like the Monroe County um, Sheriff's Department in Louisiana or uh, with, with uh, law enforcement agencies in Connecticut and New York. And really these agencies have no business um, having this information and being able to query um, Marin County's, uh, you know, information about who's been driving where and for, you know, being able to piece together uh, pieces of people's lives. So um, we hope that this lawsuit puts many of those other entities on notice that they need to stop sharing now um, with out-of-state and federal agencies or risk um, potential legal liability. I, I remember going through these these documents showing like all these police departments and who they're sharing data with. And it always amused me to see the places all over the continental U.S. were sharing data with the Honolulu Police Department, because maybe there, there are some cars coming from Honolulu to, you know, to, you know, New York State. But I imagine there's just not enough of it to really justify in any remote way that kind of data sharing, because Cars just don't move across the ocean. Um, okay, so Sarah, Sarah what, what are some changes we'd like to see in the world when it comes to ALPR uh, beyond, you know, you know, just ending the sharing with, with ICE? 
Yeah. So, you know, the, many of the, the activists in Marin County in, in, um, uh, in our lawsuit, they are really asking for the sheriff to stop using ALPR altogether for all the reasons that we've identified. Um, the fact that you could piece together pieces of people's lives, you can tell where they live and work, where they drop their kids off to school, where they associate, where they're attending um, an immigration uh, clinic or going to the doctor or going to religious services. And that really is very, very revealing information. You know, um, I think we have identified and courts have identified the issues with location, location-based location tracking. And this is another form of location-based tracking um, that we need, to, we need to stop. So, you know, law enforcement agencies really need to consider whether they wanna continue using this type of um, technology, especially as Dave has shown, it's rather unjustifiable in many senses when you have um, this vast amount of information being collected and very little yielding any sort of real uh, leads. Um, but apart from that, we've also, um, we, you know, we also believe in um, curtailing down the retention periods um, for this type of information. Uh, there really is no need for law enforcement to retain people's inf uh, ALPR data um, for years on end. Um, if it's not uh, lead, you know, doesn't lead to a hit immediately. If it's not on a hot list, what's the purpose of storing this information? Um, and so we have called for this in, surely in, in our own um, state legislation, um, but around the country, there is very little, um, there are very few safeguards being, being placed. Um, there's one state, New Hampshire, that has a fairly short retention period, but most states just haven't identified the issue or haven't addressed the issue. And so it really then becomes up to each entity, each law enforcement agency to put their own um, safeguards on it, which, you know, spoiler alert, they won't. Um, or for some of the companies that are retaining this information um, to potentially say, oh, okay, we'll put a retention period on it. But we really are at the whims of like law enforcement and private industry um, in order to make that happen. So just to sort of wrap it up before we get into questions, um, I just wanted to just express like how how pleased I was to see this win the Twitter poll because this is something we've been working on for so many years. And you know, every year I'm like, do people still care about license plate readers anymore? Or we've moved on to face recognition. Have we moved on to, to something else? Like, you know, have we have, have we lost people's attention before we've actually like had the impact? And clearly, you know, you all still care about this. I still care about this. We're still filing lawsuits. And so this isn't just some technology that people have accepted. And so to leave things on a positive note, um, I would say you shouldn't accept this technology. I would say that, you know, things that you can do uh, to empower yourself or to have an impact or just keep an eye on, on city council minutes and, you know, county minutes, uh, like county commission minutes to see if, you're, if, if they're gonna be acquiring new license plate readers and just, you know, you can always just show up at city hall and, or, or during a city council hearing and just, you know, give a good three minutes of testimony about how they should pause ask more questions, really nail down answers to all the things. Like, why do you say you need it for a year when you could have it for three days? What's the difference between that? And asking questions like, who's going to have access to this data and who are you going to share this data with? You can also file public records requests. Pretty easy to do. We have some samples on our website that you could file with your local agency. Um, but also, you know, just keep an eye out for, for um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, legislation or other kinds of, of activism opportunities where just sending a letter to your member of Congress or your state legislator might, uh, you know, might have an impact. And also we're advocating for uh, these ordinance models uh, around the country that are called CCOPS, that's C-C-O-P-S, for community control over police surveillance. And that is trying to convince uh, municipal bodies to put a process in, in place where police can't acquire technology without having a public hearing and without having it approved by a city council first. So making sure that your elected representatives are signing off on anything and that police just can't grab it and then you know, start using it without any safeguards in place. And so we're at uh, 20 minutes to, to the hour. And so uh, I figure we're gonna hand over to some questions at this point. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Christian. Uh, I work on the membership team here to chat with all of y'all here. Um, 
we have a ton of questions in the chat. So I think that I'm gonna go through some of them. We'll see how many we can go through, but also uh, if you raise your hand, I can see that too. And hopefully I can call on some folks with their hands raised as well. Um, but to start, I thought this question was interesting from Blue Wombat, which is, at what level would it be most effective to have le legislation limiting and rolling back the use of ALPRs, federal, state, or local? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I tend to not, I mean, I, I, I don't wanna to speak too much for our legislative team, um, uh, but I tend to focus on what is like you know, most achievable and, you know, we have seen that there's been a lot of effort to influence policy on the municipal level, um, mostly because city council members are just more responsive to their constituents than, say, a U.S. senator. Um, you know, if you have um, a big enough state like California and you're able to get a law passed, that is going to, you know, help a whole bunch of people in one swath. And I think that if you just look at the number of bills passed by the California legislature every year versus the number of bills passed by Congress every year, you'll know that that it's just a different process uh, that results in more things getting passed. And so I feel like the chances are better at the state legislative level, but it varies state to state because some state legislatures only meet every two years and only for like 60 days. So it may be difficult there. Um, but certainly, I know, sorry, do you have any ideas on whether, like, how well a congressional, like a federal law would, would impact it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't think that we've um, really talked about that too much. You know, there have been um, various uh, federal laws that have been introduced to, uh, uh, you know, to impact certain types of surveillance technologies. Like I'm thinking about Ron Wyden's, um, the Fourth Amendment is not for sale act, which, um, you know, tries to uh, limit the amount of information that that uh, the federal government can collect through data brokers and things like that. Um, but we haven't really discussed something um, as large as ALPRs. I mean, the, the real issue is that many of the law enforcement agencies are at the local and state levels. They're the ones who are collecting this. They're the ones who are networking, um, sometimes with federal agencies, like we've seen ICE and CBP, but oftentimes they're really just connecting with other state and local entities to share this information. And so I think like state, the state and local level, both are great to consider potential legislation. Cool. Uh, thanks for your thoughts on those. Let's look. Um, this question comes from H. Um, you mentioned law enforcement buying access to this data. Have there been any instances of the opposite where private companies can buy ALPR data from law enforcement agencies? Is that something that can happen? So I am not aware of uh, private companies purchasing data collected by law enforcement agencies. I'm not going to say that's not that hasn't happened. Um, I just don't have any like paper evidence that it's happened. What does happen is that is that private companies are able to purchase license plate reader data from the private companies that collect it. So um, I mentioned DRN data. You know, DRN data will often claim it has like 10 billion you know, 10 billion license plate scans in its database. And one third of those, those plates were collected by law enforcement, but two thirds uh, were, create, were collected by their private contractors. So the bulk of that data is stuff that people can buy access to. And usually you see insurance companies and lenders and a lot of the most predatory industries using that to, to invade people's privacy. Um, all right, and then we'll go through another question that was in the chat from David. Um, talking about um, a law allowing parked cars to cover their license plates, um, what other solutions are available? Um, would CAPTCHA style license plate letters slash numbers be a possible solution? The, the difficulty is, is that a lot of states and particularly California uh, we, you know, this was very specific to California. Is that California has a law that says that you cannot do anything to your license plate that would interfere with a license plate reader, with the exception that you can cover your entire vehicle to protect it from the elements. And so it was this law that written that if you wanted to mess with your license plate, that was against the law. But you you cover your entire car. It's so we were just saying that like. If you can cover your entire car when you're parked, 
why can't you just cover the license plate? Certainly not while you're driving, but like while you're parked, while you're in your driveway, what's the big deal? Um, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of other, other options because the way the law is written in California, it doesn't really leave much room. Um, um, the, the one thing I would say, uh, uh, and it's kind of more of a, of a novelty idea than an, an actual practical one, is the idea of uh, putting up like fake license plates around a city um, so that the license plates are just reading a bunch of garbage all the time. And I was talking to this um, activist slash fashion designer named Kate Burtash uh, about just this, you know, bizarre idea that would just be, you know, cost tons of money and require lots of volunteers and maybe not even be effective. But she was like, you know what, let's put this, let's put this on some fashion. So she made some license plate reader patterns and has made uh, shirts and dresses and jackets with the idea that police cars will actually read these as cars and create garbage data for their system. Um, I can't like recommend that as an actual thing because I think that it's, it just doesn't work at scale, but there's an interesting thought experiment. Okay, let's uh, break some things up and it looks like we've got one hand raised from the audience. Uh, David, do you wanna take it over for a second? Um, hi, uh, what I'm wondering about is a similar technology which would be facial recognition. Do uh, the license plate readers also take facial recognition da data, maybe pair who the driver in the car is along with what vehicle they're driving? And what would be your, your concern with the risk of if the license plate readers would uh, just skip over the license plates entirely and just start, start monitoring all the faces of who's driving vehicles and tracking people that way? Um, yeah, so I'll answer part of it and maybe Sarah can answer part of it as well. Um, so the company, the main company that sells license plate readers to police is a company called Vigilant Solutions, and it does offer face recognition technology. Their license plate reader technology is called Plate Search. Their face recognition technology is called Face Search. Um, so they are actually out now offering that technology to police. Um, it's less a case of saying of, of so what we're, what we're seeing what we're seeing is less a case of adding face recognition to license plate readers and more adding license plate recognition and face recognition technology to existing camera systems or adding, you know, having camera systems that are connected to computers that are doing face recognition, license plate recognition, pattern recognition, object tracing, hot spot identification, you know, like these, these kind of computer vision uh, views of the road. I haven't seen so much of, um, of hardware systems that are designed to both capture the plate and the face of the person um, in a standard license plate reader, um, just because that's a lot more infrastructure because if you're you just gonna actually have two cameras, you know, often. Uh, um, but I think where you see that kind of technology more commonly is in uh, like red light cameras and speed cameras. But I'm not sure that those speed cameras, all day, while they are capturing people's faces, I'm not sure I've seen them using face recognition on those, those photos. Yeah, to, to add a little bit, I mean, that, that is a real concern. Um, one really interesting thing was when um, Dave mentioned this breach that happened at the, uh, I believe it was at the US-Canada border a couple of years ago. Um, and it was where license plates were just kind of disclosed um, by a subcontractor to Customs and Border Protection called Perceptics. And during that breach, about 50,000 people's license plate information was revealed. But at the same time, that same checkpoint was also collecting face prints of people, so facial imaging. And that was also revealed. Um, and it was unclear. It, it seems to be that, you know, one technology was collecting the license plate, the other technology was collecting face prints. And so it is possible to identify, it may be possible to identify who was driving when. Um, but that is a real concern. Um, we've seen um, as the proliferation of technology has exploded um, at the, particularly the Southern border, but also at the, at the Northern border, um, we have seen um, this issue of all kinds of surveillance technologies that are operating in perpetuity and, and, and um, in conjunction with one another. Um, so you have to worry about ALPRs at the same time as like these huge sort of like CBP substations and blimps and um, facial imaging. And it really does sort of paint um, a very, um, 
a detailed picture of who may be going through at, at what time. Cool. Thank you guys. And thank you, David, for asking the question. Um, one question, another question in the chat that I thought was uh, interesting is um, from Grady. Have you seen any stories on the news of police departments making the case for their ALPR systems, such as like the data that we got from ALPRs was crucial for solving this case? Is this something you see often or? So I see it pretty often, but it's often not coming from law enforcement. It's coming from the vendor. Like vendors really love to find examples where their technology was effective and then trumpet it through press releases, through trying to feed the media stuff. Um, and, and I don't doubt that there's, that there's um, you know, times where this, this technology helps them find somebody. I think that the technology was um, used to find some of the, the people who, you know, involved in the January 6 events. Um, but I don't, I, I'm not of the position that, you know, a few, you know, stolen cars recovered or a few people they tracked down is worth sacrificing the privacy of every driver in the United States. I just think that is not, um, what we would call, um, a, a necessary and proportionate use of the technology. It, it, you know, I think that, probably for the most part, they're using these to solve, um, you know, car thefts. Um, and, you know, I certainly don't want my car stolen, but I also think my privacy is super important as well. Cool. I think we have a few more minutes for a couple more questions. Remember, if you want to uh, raise your hand to ask your question, you totally can. Uh, but we'll go with another question from the chat from George Vasquez. Um, given that ALPRs are being used regardless of various concerns, are there any best practices that can be adopted by law enforcement that, were to, that would reduce future discrimination and other risks associated with ALPRs? Sorry, you wanna start with that one? I mean, <laughs> You know, I, I think I think it is sort of repeating what I've said before about you know um, whether these should be in use at all, um, and to the extent that they are actually in use, allowing the community to have some sort of say about you know what what the community's values are. So um, these CCOPS ordinances do allow um, communities to do that. It allows people to weigh in before law enforcement agencies start procuring various surveillance technologies, and even if they possess them now to have a say in how they are used. And so um, there are about 18 CCOPS ordinances that have passed um, across the country, um, mostly at the local level, but um, as in the city level, but also some in, at the county level. Um, and what it requires is before a law enforcement agency is able to acquire or use um, a, such a system, um, they first have to seek permission from their uh, governing body, so either a board of supervisors or a city council, um, and it also uh, sort of goes through each of the technologies and limits the ways in which the technologies may be used. And so, you know, um, one of the things I think that can really help um, would be uh, reducing retention periods, making sure that um, these law enforcement agencies aren't able to basically, you know, track all the information um, and collect all the information and then keep it um, forever. You know, uh, I'm thinking about certain communities um, we've seen in Marin County, for example, where um, there are only two, one or two ways into the town itself. And so what the police do is mount um, a license plate reader at the entrance slash exit um, of the town. And so it captures every single person that is driving through. Um, that is incredibly invasive. And so um, given that law enforcement agencies are sort of figuring out and, and, and deciding where they wanna position these technologies, um, I think one, one way of doing it is to say, you know, if you don't have a hit immediately, you need to, purge um, the license plate from your records so that uh, you're not just keeping it and I, you know, using it in the future to piece together people's movements or identify people for whatever future crime may be taking place. Because as Dave mentioned, you know, this really um, gets us into sort of like dystopic realities um, that could very well be the future for us. Yeah, I, I would I would add that I mean like I'm not really in the it's not really my job to write policies for for law enforcement, but I would say that if they have a policy that says that anybody in the police department can search ALPR for any reason, 
that's a no-go. They shouldn't be doing that. If they are not keeping a log of every time somebody searches the system or adds a new like license plate to a hot list, they're doing it terribly. If they do not have somebody whose job is to review you know, all the searches and to make sure that the searches were legitimate and not some cop stalking his ex, they're doing it wrong. Uh, uh, I, I would say when it comes to retention, yeah, they, I don't think that police in general need to retain the data uh, if it's not somebody who's already known to them or it's already part of their investigation. But it's worth asking police departments to look at their use of ALPR and see how far they actually are going back. If the data is not useful to them beyond a week, they shouldn't be storing data beyond a week. But I have a feeling that in most cases, data is not useful to them more than a day old. And it's, so the question is, why do you hold it for two years or more if it's most of the, the use cases are known vehicles and in a very short period of time? Cool. Uh, and then this question comes from uh, Nate B, which is, since there's already precedent for homeowners, homeowners associations and other private entities running ALPR networks, uh, I was wondering how the police feel to find uh, every police vehicle tracked by a network of citizens. Um, is that a concern you guys have heard about? Um, so I go to a lot of police conferences and so I end up getting in conversations with cops. And one of the things that I tell them is that Every surveillance technology you're promoting now uh, is gonna turn on you. Like you might find be very excited about face recognition now. Down the road, it's gonna be impossible for you to do undercover investigations because of face recognition. You're worried about your privacy as an officer now. And so you wanna make sure that you're, you know, you pass laws in like places like California and other states that you know allow you to withhold your drive, you know, your address from various public forms. That's great. I can go in a license plate reader system and I can find out where you live. Like I do try to impress upon cops that everything that is a privacy violation to all of us, police are part of all of us. They don't, they're not like separate, like these mass surveillance technologies capture information on everybody, regardless of whether you're a cop or an immigrant. And they really need to keep in mind that violating our privacy is violating their own privacy. Now, I don't know that, 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 there is really any good way for a community to really track police using their own license plate reader systems. And I'm not going to advocate for that either. Um, uh, because again, I, 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 I really don't, I mean, just personally to me, I don't think like tracking police is worth sacrificing everybody else's privacy either. I will add, there's also sort of an, uh, sort of an unequal, um, power right um not all people are going to be able to access alpr whereas all law you know many law enforcement agencies set it so that anybody in their system can can access alpr and so um you know the the privacy concerns while they should be concerning to them as dave has mentioned um you know it's not like the average person for the most part is able to just access any alpr system and get information to it Cool. Thank you. Um, it looks like we're at the hour. So I was wondering if uh, Dave and Syra, if you guys had any closing thoughts before we uh, end the speakeasy. I just want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, it's great to see so much interest and participation and so many great questions that we unfortunately were not able to get to in the chat. Um, if you like um, you know, this topic, please check out our future speakeasies. Um, you can see more about our work on a ALPR on our street level surveillance um, page at EFF.org. And um, you know, just basically keep, keep pushing for this, keep fighting for your privacy, keep pushing um, CCOPS ordinances in your local towns, keep talking about it with other people. Because I think that we don't have to accept that this technology is inevitable and that we have no control over it. I think one way that we really do, um, we are able to get control over this and really impress our values upon others is to talk about it often and with people who care about these issues. And you'll find that there are more people than you expect out there who, are, who will also be similarly concerned. It's just a matter of education and making sure people are, are aware of what types of surveillance technologies are being used in their communities. Yeah. I'm 
just, you know, echoing everything Syra just said, um, you know, I'm really, really grateful that you all have this interest. Uh, I would just plug that uh, you check out atlasofsurveillance.org to learn about surveillance technology near you. Um, if you're in California, we have a data set on our website called Data Driven 2 that will covers, I think, like 90, 90 police departments across California and will tell you who they're sharing data with, how much data they're collecting, and how much of that is useful to an investigation. Um, and then also, uh, we have a, a, a virtual reality game called Spot the Surveillance for those of you with uh, various headsets that will place you into a street corner in San Francisco and challenge you to spot the surveillance technology in your environment. And spoiler, there are multiple forms of license plate readers in that environment. Um, you can also, there's also a desktop version, so you don't have to have a, a headset. You can, you know, click around your browser, but it's, uh, it's a really fun time, um, if a little bit scary. Cool. Well, thank you again, uh, Dave and Syrah, uh, and thank you everyone who joined the Speakeasy. Um, it's been really cool to see people with uh, their cameras on wearing EFF gear and stuff. Uh, thank you so much for all of the support. Uh, I saw one question that was like, how can we support EFF further? Um, and I would just say spreading the word about our work and engaging with our work is really helpful and like pretty much all we can ask for. So that's really helpful. But um, thank you again, everyone for joining. Um, and I hope you have a good rest of your night.